Stories from the East and West. Ten twenty p.m. It's a bitterly cold November night in Warsaw. A family of four sits shivering in the darkness of an abandoned alley, hoping nobody sees them. Around ten minutes later, a dark green Volvo with diplomatic plates pulls up beside their hiding spot. One of them, recognizing the car, gestures to the drivers, then motions the rest of his family to come out. All four quickly climb into the car before it speeds off into the night. After getting in, the family lay on the car floor and are covered with blankets. Everyone remains silent as they drive through the empty streets of Warsaw. The drivers pay careful attention to the traffic laws to avoid raising suspicion. After another ten minutes, though it probably felt like years to the family, they arrive at the American Embassy and park in a dark corner of the compound. The family get out of the car and are ordered into the back of a large van. Inside, they find four packing cartons. They each climb into one before they're sealed shut. The van doors are closed, and they begin the drive towards the East German border. One member of this family will be the focus of today's episode. A story full of commitment, tragedy, controversy, patriotism, and of course, espionage. Hi, I'm Adam. And I'm John. And you're listening to Stories from the East and West. In today's show, we're going to tell you a remarkable story of Cold War espionage that not too many people know about. But one man does. I'm Ben Weiser. I'm a reporter at the New York Times. Weiser is the author of A Secret Life, The Polish Colonel, His Covert Mission, and The Price He Had to Pay to Save His Country. His book served as one of the main inspirations for what you're about to hear. As a child during the Nazi occupation of Poland, Richard Kuklinski witnessed the unimaginable brutality of the German soldiers. His experience, and I'm sure, I remember that he told me it was similar to so many Poles, but it was when he was just a child, I believe nine years old, when the Nazis invaded Warsaw, invaded Poland. Massacres in the street, the burning and demolition of buildings, the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Just awful atrocities, something no child should ever be subjected to. And uh, uh, he ultimately lost his father in that, in the war. Um, and it was just a horrific experience for him. And he, and he always reminds me that he was, his experience was like so many people uh, in Poland. As Weiser says, the war was tough for Kukinski. Not only did he lose his father, he even spent time in a German labor camp. It's hard to imagine how he endured all this, especially as a child. But it did show just how resilient he truly was. When the war ended, Kuklinski set his sights on the Polish army, joining at the ripe old age of 17. And after the war, he eventually entered the Polish army, was an extremely loyal soldier, and as most know, he worked his way up in the army. Um, uh, he was a very smart and, and, and uh, careful writer. Uh, he, he was talented. Uh, he was well-liked. Uh, and ultimately, he rose to become a, an important member of the, uh, of the general staff. Though he did enjoy a great deal of success, that wasn't the full story. Keep in mind that after the war, even though Poland had shaken off one oppressor, another one came in. The Soviet Union. And Kuklinski was not happy about it, particularly since he was witnessing firsthand the gradual Sovietization of the Polish army. And I think he ultimately concluded that Poland really needed to be its own country and not dominated by another. And I think that's 
that began to shape the way he saw the world uh, as, as time progressed. But even once he was a colonel, it didn't mean Kuklinski could change this unfortunate reality. The Polish army was being remade along Soviet lines in every imaginable respect. Drills, teachers, uniforms, ideological training, you name it. And it wasn't just the army. It was the entire country that was being transformed into a puppet state. Once again, Poland had lost its sovereignty to a foreign power. Despite his strong reservations concerning the lack of independence and the situation inside the Polish army, Kuklinski continued his climb up the army ladder. By the late 1960s, he was a well-respected officer. And this is where our story becomes even more interesting, when he seemingly had everything going for him. Two things happened that changed everything for Kuklinski. He was uh, really sickened uh, by the 1968 Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, and also two years later by the by the use of, of, of Polish troops to strike at uh, uh, to shoot at uh, striking workers uh, uh, and uh, in Poland, and and I think he ultimately felt that you know Poland was on the wrong side, and and that its values were much more closely aligned with the West. And in 1972, I believe. He reached out to the American military. Yes, you heard that right. A high-ranking official in Poland's communist military decided to reach out to American intelligence. In 1972, Kuklinski sent a letter to the American military attaché in Bonn, Germany, and requested a meeting. Dear sir, I'm sorry for my English. I'm a foreign MAF from communist country. I want to meet secretly with U.S. Army officer, Lieutenant Colonel Colonel, August 17, 18, 19, in Amsterdam or 21st, 22, in Ostenda. It have no many time. I am with my comrade and they can't know. The American officials in Bonn couldn't turn down an opportunity like this. So, after a bit of planning, they finally met in the Netherlands. Kuklinski informed them that he had access to highly classified and consequential information, in particular. The most important thing he did at the very beginning was sort of explain the, 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 the Soviet war plans for Europe. The Americans were obviously pretty happy to hear all this. Um, you know, the Pentagon, the United States Pentagon's most deep-seated fear at the time was that Moscow and the Warsaw Pact, which had a huge advantage in conventional forces, would attack Western Europe without a big buildup. If there was indeed a Soviet invasion of Western Europe... So the West instead would sort of take an intermediate step and use nuclear weapons to hit what was known as the second strategic echelon. This was a second wave of forces from, from, from the Soviet Union but after they had left Soviet territory, but before they arrived in Western Europe. And there was only one place where that could occur, Kuklinski concluded, and that was Poland. Um, And as he told me, about 95% of the thousands of tanks and other vehicles that made up this second wave would have to pass through Poland before reaching West Germany, France, Holland, and Belgium. And that meant Poland would be targeted by NATO for 400 to 600 direct nuclear hits. And as Kuklinski told me, even if the Soviet Union and the rest of the Warsaw Pact succeeded in their attack, Poland would be destroyed. Kuklinski put it bluntly. Our front could only be a sacrifice of Polish blood at the altar of Red Empire. So it was decided that they would begin working together a Polish military officer and American intelligence agents. They would soon meet in Warsaw, where their unlikely operation would begin. In all further correspondence between the two sides, Kuklinski's name would never be mentioned again. It was far too dangerous. He was given a code name. Jack Strong. After returning to Poland from his surveillance trip, Kuklinski began his espionage career. As Jack Strong, he began to communicate extensively with the Americans. But communication between Kuklinski and the Americans was far from straightforward. Initially, the Americans communicated with Kuklinski in Poland 
through various means. They would leave things for him called dead drops. That's when they would put something at a location. He would come pick it up at another time. Besides dead drops, there were also other methods that Kuklinski and the Americans used to communicate. But they also perfected the art of handing him things in what they called a car pass, where a, a car would drive down the street and make a right turn, and he would be waiting on the, on the turn. Typically, the agency believed that it, its people were being followed by the Polish secret police. But in the two or three second gap that existed when the American car would turn right, but before the Polish secret police would make its right turn, that's when a handoff would occur to Kuklinski, who would then disappear into the shadows. They also made use of advanced communications tech. The United States gave Kuklinski an electronic communications device, which today, you know, would almost seem like an iPhone or, or something like that. But back then was quite unique and very expensive to make of itself. But it allowed him to communicate with the agency through electronic means, very short bursts of information. Despite the huge risks he faced, Kuklinski sent the Americans masses of intel. Kuklinski uh, uh, was able to provide the United States with a lot of, of, of intense, intensely important intelligence material about the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact and their plans, uh, in his view, to you know, both destroy the United States but also destroy Poland and, and, and parts of Western Europe. The extent of his espionage was staggering. At one point, some U.S. officials even commented that Jack Strong was the best-placed person and most reliable source in the entire Eastern Bloc. In total, he provided the West with over 35,000 pages of classified information. However, the operation was not perfect. There were several instances where Kuklinski's cover was nearly blown. Sure, there were close calls, as you can imagine. Um, you know, just... Uh, there's no way for me to convey them in this interview the way they, they, I think they, you know, with the excitement that they played out. Let's give Ben Weiser some music, shall we? There was one time when he was in the midst of, of making one of those car passes or receiving a package in a car pass when he got caught in the headlights of a Polish secret police vehicle. And he literally spent the night on the run. As I recall, he even went to an all-night barber shop and actually cut his hair and, and really tried to change his appearance because he believed he had been seen and spotted and was going to be followed and, and caught. Another time. When he was in the process of using a very tiny camera that he had been given by the CIA to take photographs of, of documents. And he, was, he, he sort of would position his arms on the table like a tripod so the camera would not shake. And he was in the process of taking a picture when the door opened to the office he was in. And as I recall, uh, another officer walked in. And Kuklinski, in just a single motion that, that is still hard to believe, turned the camera into a lighter and made it look like he was just about to light a cigarette. And these were just a couple of the close calls. Even though he was careful, what Kuklinski was doing was extremely dangerous. Mistakes were bound to happen, especially at the volume he was working. And it ultimately lasted about nine years. This Mission Impossible couldn't go on forever. After a while, it became apparent that Jack Strong's luck was running out. On November 2nd, 1981, Kuklinski was called to a meeting with other military leaders. After walking in and taking a seat, there was an awkward silence. One of the officers in the room broke the silence with an abrupt announcement. There had been a leak, and it was a leak about their plans to bring in martial law, a huge crackdown on civil liberties due to begin mid-December. This was an act of treason. Kuklinski sat there in disbelief. He hadn't been accused of leaking the documents, but he knew only a few people had access to them. It was only a matter of time before his name came up. He had to act, and fast. He wrote a letter. He wrote a, a note to the agency pretty much saying that everything is pointing to the end of my, my mission. Then he had to tell the most important people of all. And he went home and told his family for the first time, his kids for the first time. Uh, he had two sons and his wife, and said that within hours or days, they might have to be exfiltrated or taken out of Poland. Um, and his family ultimately decided to go with him. On November 7th, the family met at an abandoned alley and waited in the dark. 
After several minutes, a car with American plates showed up. Kuklinski, his wife, and his two sons climbed into the car before it sped away. And here's where we return to the beginning of our episode, to the back of that van and the Kuklinski family hiding in boxes. After the van arrived at the East German border, the family remained silent, hiding in their boxes while the van's drivers talked to the border guards. They could hear arguing. It lasted an agonising 25 minutes. It turned out that the licence plate on the van, which had only recently been obtained by the embassy, wasn't on the register of plates they kept at the border. They could hear the guards walking around the van, barking orders. Somehow, luckily, they never looked inside. Much to the relief of the family, the van's engine started up once again, beginning the drive through East Germany to West Berlin. The Kuklinskis had escaped Poland. After arriving in West Berlin, the US Army quickly flew them to the States for safety. But that didn't mean Kuklinski's service had come to an end. He came to the United States in 1981, shortly before the actual crackdown. Uh, And for many years, he served as an advisor to to the Pentagon, uh, to American military officers, helping them understand how the the Soviet and Warsaw Pact military officials we're thinking what would be their strategies, how they, would, how they would do things. Despite escaping Poland, the Kuklinskis did not have easy lives. For one, soon after arriving in the US, Kuklinski found out that the military court in Poland had given him a death sentence. Then, something even more tragic happened. He sadly lost both of his sons, um, and he had, to, he had to remain in hiding for a long time. The circumstances surrounding the deaths of his sons were ambiguous, even suspicious. Some people believe Kuklinski was a hero who served valiantly in adverse circumstances. For many in US intelligence, including the late Zbigniew Brzezinski, he was unofficially the first Polish officer of NATO. Others, however, do not think highly of him. They believe he was a traitor, a deceitful individual who betrayed his homeland for the interests of a foreign power. In order to better understand his divisive legacy, it helps to put both Kuklinski and his actions in context. First, we need a better understanding of Cold War espionage as a whole. Let's zoom out a bit. You have to remember that this thing we call the Cold War was really an existential confrontation between two sides that did not understand each other very well. You know, the Soviet Union and the United States, the East and the West, there were a lot of things that kept the other side very mysterious. That was David Hoffman, journalist for the Washington Post and author of the best-selling book Billion Dollar Spy. As Hoffman says, the Cold War was an existential confrontation, not just a clash of political and economic ideologies. There was a great deal of misunderstanding between the East and West, which was made only worse by the secrecy both sides tried to maintain. Espionage came about as a way of trying to understand the opposing side. The density and the intensity of espionage in this time was oftentimes dictated by these great uh, deal of mistrust and distrust, misperception between these two blocks. The first thing that both sides were very afraid of was that they might be surprised militarily. And so a big priority for espionage on both sides was to avoid such a surprise by sending spies out to discover the military secrets of the other. Each side had legions of staff trying to understand the other. These were mostly the analysts, the people that, you know, read all the data and tried to make sense of it. One time during the Cold War, the CIA director checked in on an office he rarely visited. And he came up to one cubicle and a woman was working there and she had on her uh, wall or right there on the edge of the cubicle on a bookshelf a can of peas from a Soviet grocery store. And the CIA director said, I'm sorry, but why is that there? What do you do? And she said, I am the canned goods analyst for the Soviet Union. Maybe a little ridiculous, but it really does show how expansive this conflict was. 
Inevitably, the governments of both the Eastern and Western blocs had to rely heavily on individual operatives to gather intelligence. Sometimes these operatives were sent from the original country to the country of interest. Other times, as in Kuklinski's case, they were dissidents operating from within. Let's look at another example. Take Adolf Tolkachev, a Soviet citizen who spied for the US and was executed for his actions. In the case of Adolf Tolkachev, who I, I wrote about in The Billion Dollar Spy, he was very deeply unhappy with what the Soviet system had become. His uh, wife's parents were repressed under Stalin. Um, his wife's mother was executed. Her father sent to the gulag. This was part of the family legacy and something that burned inside of him. Another example worth considering is Oleg Gordievsky, who became disillusioned with his work in the KGB and began to work with British intelligence. Oleg Pienkowski was another Soviet citizen who became disillusioned with the Soviet Union and began providing information to US intelligence. He was, like Tolkachev, executed for his actions. And there are many, many more cases that we haven't even mentioned. We could go on, but you get the point. So, as noted, disillusionment was a very common reason for spying. But it was far from the only reason. Money, of course, was a motivation for some spies. Although the large amounts of cash the CIA paid Tolkachev seemed to have been meaningless. The CIA gave him a lot of money. He had nowhere to spend it. There was nothing to buy in that period in Moscow with all the shortages. He kept the money in a shoebox. What the hell do you think spies are? Moral philosophers measuring everything they do against the word of God or Karl Marx? They're not. They're just a bunch of seedy, squalid bastards like me. Little men, drunkards, queers, henpecked husbands, civil servants playing cowboys and Indians to brighten their rotten little lives. Do you think they sit like monks in a cell balancing right against wrong? That angry speech from the spy who came in from the cold may take it a bit too far, but there may be a point there too. Espionage has often been romanticised by popular culture. Spies themselves are often praised as these moral agents serving some noble higher purpose. When it comes to the motivations of Kuklinski and Tolkachev, Hoffman has some clear thoughts. But I think in both of these agents were men driven by principle. They were not driven by greed. And I say that because a lot of spies were driven by money, ego, um, by other factors than just some lofty, noble principles. Back to Kuklinski's story. The extreme death charges against him were later reduced and eventually dropped several years after the fall of communism. It was a long time coming, to say the least. The court that made this ruling stated that Kuklinski had been acting under special circumstances that warranted higher need. And in 1998, he was finally able to visit the country of his birth and his return was triumphant. He was met with cheering crowds, singing choirs, parades and celebrations. The most notable part about his return to Poland might have been the widely anticipated speech he gave in Kraków. I consider myself to be an ordinary soldier of the Republic who did not do anything beyond the sacred duty of serving one's homeland in need. What perhaps differentiates me from the enormous number of people involved in the historic transformations of Poland and Europe is the specific nature of the mission I undertook and the consequences it caused. It is, therefore, still hard for me to believe that everything I am experiencing at the moment is really happening. And the praise for Kuklinski didn't stop with his return trip. Shortly after his death in 2004, the Polish government promoted him to the rank of general. He was then buried with honours in Warsaw and given honorary citizenship of several cities in Poland. I think it's safe to say that the later independent government's opinion of Kuklinski was quite different from that of the government during the communist regime. But it does beg the question, just how should we judge spies and their actions? I think that the smart people in intelligence will tell you that in the end of the day, when you strip away all that nonsense about, you know, spying and dead drops and flashy technology and secret devices, and when you strip all that away, what really counts are the values that the agent is working for, are the values of what the spy believes. And, you know, in the case of Tolkachev, he, um, he had never touched a dollar bill. 
He never set foot in America. He didn't. He had confessed in his own letters to CIA. He didn't really know much about America, but he knew how deeply he disliked it, the values of the Soviet system. The he called it this incredible, impassable, ideological hypocrisy. Now, in the case of Kuklinski, again, it's a different case at a different time and a different man. But I think it's really important to ask,、um, why did he do it, and what did he see in the existing system at the time that caused him to rebel? I mean, what was he fighting for? What were the values that he really cared about? And at least my understanding is that he considered himself a patriot who cared about a free, democratic Poland. You know, as far as his legacy is concerned, I think that he he simply believed he did the right thing.、Um, And he ultimately decided, you know, others would would judge him, but I know that he never felt that he had made a mistake. But he did feel, and he understood that he had, you know, paid quite a price, and his family had for what he did. This episode of Stories from the East and West was a Wire Walker Studio production for Culture. Pl. Our team included Wojciech Olekshak, Adam Żuławski, John Beecham, Nitzan Reisner, and Michael Keller. A big thanks to Ben Weiser and David Hoffman for joining us on this episode. You can find links to Weiser's book, A Secret Life, the Polish officer, his covert mission, and the price he paid to save his country, and Hoffman's book, The Billion Dollar Spy: A True Story of Cold War Espionage and Betrayal, in the show notes. To see the notes from this episode, just tap the show art in your podcast app or visit storiesfromtheeastandwest.com. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe for future episodes. And remember to give us a review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help others find the podcast too.